Um, thank you everyone so much um, for coming out. Um, few issues thus far in 2012 have so rapidly gained the attention of the internet community as the proposed uh, Stop Online Privacy and Protect IP Acts in Congress, otherwise known as SOPA and PIPA. Um, the bills, um, which were originally drafted with the intention of limiting online piracy, um, were derided by many for its scope and its implementation, and we're very pleased today to have one of the key figures not only of that debate, but of the larger debate over web privacy in general. Um, Alexis Ohanian, along with Steve Huffman, founded in 2009 Reddit, um, reddit.com, which is now commonly known as the front page of the internet. Um, Reddit.com has since then grown um, exponentially and is now one of the most visited sites on the web. Um, having left the site in an official capacity in 2009, um, Alexis has since launched several endeavors, including the launching of breadpig.com and his own investment and consulting company, um, Das Kapital Capital. Um, so please join me on behalf of the Georgetown University Lecture Fund, uh, Georgetown College Democrats, College Republicans, Hoyes for Liberty, uh, the McDonough School of Business, and of course the Computer Science Club in welcoming uh, Alexis Ohanian for a lecture and Q&A today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Sean. Hello, everyone. Hi, Alexis. Yes, all right, now, uh, this reminds me, you guys make me feel so old. I graduated from college in 2005. I went down uh, to school at the University of Virginia, don't hold it against me, uh, and one of the things that I do, I, I give a fair number of talks, and I love, 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 love speaking at universities for one big reason, and that is I can use a cute photo of your mascot in my opening slide. Uh, now, this doesn't work for all schools. Some schools have really terrible mascots, or they don't even have mascots, they have like colors. I won't name names, but that seems kind of ridiculous. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> incidentally, I have not yet been asked to come back to speak at UVA, so I don't know if I've done something wrong there. But uh, the good news is I have about 45 minutes to fill your brains with as much knowledge as I can drop in this span. After that, I want to take some questions, uh, but I want you all to know that I'm coming to you actually as an entrepreneur. I, I have only known starting tech companies since graduating from college. I am in no way interested in politics, but what happened about four months ago with the announcement of SOAP and PIPA coming to the House and the Senate prompted me to, to do something I didn't ever think I would do, and that is be political. Um, let me show you very briefly the video that sort of pushed this all forward. It was a plea that I made uh, to the internet uh, about why I was so terrified about these bills. Oh, hello there. I'm Alexis Ohanian. In 2005, Steve Huffman and I started Reddit.com. A few years after that, I started a publishing company called BreadPig. And a few years after that, helped Steve launch a website called Hipmunk.com to take the agony out of travel search. In case you can't tell, I spent a lot of time on the internet. It's my livelihood. And I was thrilled to see that I was named to the Forbes 30 under 30 list in technology. But it got me thinking, if SOPA or PIPA were to become law, next year's list would probably look like a zero under 30 list in technology. Why is that? Both of these laws threaten to destroy the internet. And to make matters worse, they won't even curb piracy. There is collateral damage in addition to this not being an effective tool to combat internet piracy. It will also promote internet piracy. How come Congress can't seem to agree on anything that matters in this country? When it comes to unemployment or the deficit, they're totally gridlocked. And yet, when Hollywood shows up with $95 million paid to lobbyists in order to get a bill that they wrote passed, Republicans and Democrats line up to co-sponsor it. This just doesn't seem right. Furthermore, we have members of the House who admit that they don't understand the technology behind it. Mr. Watt, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman is one who acknowledged in his opening statement that uh, he was not a nerd and <laughs> didn't understand a lot of the technological stuff. Um, I'm not the person to argue about the technology part of this. Um. Why would you want to make a bill become a law if you don't understand how it works? We have a number of papers from some very qualified people 
who say that this hurts cybersecurity? Well, I, I don't believe... And other than saying, I, well, we've got to do something, I agree with you. I, I do not believe that, uh, but... Um, but uh, with all due respect, how... To just say, well, I don't believe that, these guys are, these guys are experts. We don't need more government attempting to meddle in places it does not understand. All right, now this, this was my first glimpse of our, the inner workings of our federal government. All right. Now, as someone who stood at the periphery, who, who was active when it came time to vote, but aside from that, just kind of let things go by, I was terrified, terrified at the thought that our elected officials, who willingly said that they had no idea what they were voting on, were so determined to get a bill passed into law. And this terrified me, along with so many other people online. Now, how many of you, by quick show of hands, use the internet? There's always one or two Luddites in the audience who are like, that's oh, a fad, it'll never catch on. Well, all right, so, so you all then clearly understand the value of this tremendous, tremendous medium. I'm gonna show you why it is not only so important to preserve in the next 45 minutes, but also the things that happened, the things that came about to be the first full-fledged online-based campaign to actually create change in a place where people didn't think a lot of change could happen. That was in Washington. And this, is, this was a movement that a lot of people described as leaderless, myself included, uh, but I later came around to describe it as leaderful, which I thought was a much better representation of just what exactly happened. And by circumstances, basically because the internet cannot fit in one room, uh, I ended up in front of a lot of the cameras and, and doing a lot of the interview stuff, but that was purely because, like I said, internet much too big to be interviewed by Soledad O'Brien, and instead a few of us got to be the ones in front of the camera, but, but it was by no way our movement to lead. Um, now, real quick, how many Skins fans who are excited about RG3? There's a couple, yes, all right, good. I was born and raised outside of DC in Maryland, so after the Colts left, before the Ravens, I'm a diehard Skins fan. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I, don't, I live in New York now, and so it's really hard because all my friends are Giants fans, and all they can do is lord over me that Super Bowl. These are the startups that I uh, have pretty much uh, helped start since graduating from college. They all have cute logos. Not required, it's just something I really like doing. And as far as I'm concerned, it is a requisite for success. Uh, this is my aforementioned co-founder, Steve Huffman, and I, when we first launched Reddit. That was us, fresh face, not long after graduating from college. I made that Reddit shirt, the first Reddit shirt in existence on Cafe Press. Uh, it was very uncomfortable. But we were a part of this thing called Y Combinator. Uh, we were actually in the very first round of it. How many of you are startup people? How many of you are people who are thinking of launching your own, who want, want to create the next Facebook? Any hands? Want to create something bigger than the next Facebook? That's good, go big. And how many of you are on the politics side? How many of you are interested in government, how all that stuff works? And the rest of you are just really confused as to why you're here. You were told there was free pizza or something, and you've, you have unfortunately been misled. Um, well, some quick background on Y Combinator. Uh, this seed stage venture firm basically created this model that's since been replicated all over the world. And it works because we have a free and fair and open internet. It says that for the value of a brand new Ford Focus, Less than $20,000, you can start a company. You can give some funds to pay for a few people to live and work for about three months, and at the end of the day, have them create a prototype, something that gets another round of investment, and eventually, a few years later, becomes a billion-dollar company. Dropbox is probably one of the best examples of this. Hopefully, you all use it for effortless file syncing. And this started with one guy, Drew Houston, who was waiting for a bus at South Station and took an amount of funding, like I said, that, that was that small and has now grown into what is legitimately a billion dollar company. Um, Reddit was one of the companies that was very lucky to be a part of Y Combinator. Uh, and we grew in part because we allowed people to create their own subreddits. And this will come in handy a little later in our story because we let someone create a subreddit for anything they wanted to. It could be cute animal photos, uh, it could be a Georgetown subreddit, it could be a SOPA subreddit. Um, people submit links, they vote on them up or down. If you find an interesting piece of content, real quick, how many of you are Redditors? All right, excellent. Oh, that makes me feel so good. You guys are all so unproductive. Note, <laughs> note those of you who did not raise your hands, you were the ones who they will be coming to for help on that next exam. Well, thank you for Redditing. Um, if basically, if you find an interesting piece of content, it could be an XKCD comic. You submit it. If people like it, they vote it up. If they don't, they vote it down. It's a rising and falling front page of what's new and interesting online. And it has grown to be, as you heard, one of the most traffic sites on the internet with this massive budget of advertising. Um, this, is, this is money I spent entirely on stickers, because what better thing to spend uh, your money on when advertising your startup than stickers? Eventually, if you spread them far enough and wide enough, people start sending you photos. That is a sticker on a black cat. As a cat owner, I can only hope that this cat was in a good place when they took it off. 
Um, that said, eventually it started snowballing. We started getting stuff like this and this, like user-generated fan art that just blew my mind. Um, and you can be sure that every single one of these people who created this got sued. Uh, we, we made sure to stamp out every single one of them who infringed on our copyright. I'm just kidding. Who would do that? <laughs> That's foreshadowing, okay? <laughs> we, instead, we saw this as a tremendous blessing. Oh my goodness, people are willing to take their hard-earned time, or sorry, they're, they're, take, they're taking their very valuable time and putting it towards recreating our logo all over. Some of them even put it on their bodies. This is Fernando Takai. This is the very first, not the last, but first Reddit alien tattoo that I've seen, and I hope he never, never regrets it. Um, he's a Brazilian Redditor, uh, and, and this is how far it's all spread. And again, with a $500 advertising budget, this only works in a world without bills like Soap and Pippa, where there's truly a level playing field. Today, Reddit, or last month rather, Reddit had 35 million unique visitors, 2.5 billion page views. All of you are very unproductive. Thank you so much for helping that. Uh, and as I said in my video, and, and as, as I've been saying for the last few months, the reason that something like this can happen, the reason that Steve and I, two recent college graduates with no connections, no authority, no reason whatsoever to be starting a company that now has as much, if not more, traffic than the New York Times front page, the reason that all works is because this is a truly free and fair playing field. Now, we did a full technical analysis, and I don't know how many engineers in the audience, I want to thank the computer science group for being part of the laundry list of folks who invited me here. If you want to take a look, we did a full technical analysis of the entire uh, Reddit site according to SOPA and PIPA and how destructive it would be. And I'm gonna cherry pick a couple of my favorite parts about how sort of terrifying all this is because you'll notice the bold language here that as long as it is facilitating the activities of copyright infringement or counterfeit products, we saw something here that at first glance, this is in the very first line of PIPA. And PIPA is, the plan was SOPA would be the terrifying house bill, and then they would come in on the white horse with PIPA and say, don't worry, those silly representatives, the Senate's got a great bill. So this is the less terrifying bill. Basically says that any user-generated website could, under the right circumstances, facilitate the activities, right? What, what is to say that this isn't a blog posting that says, oh, if you want to see the newest Transformers movie, although I have no idea why you'd really want to see it, if you want to see the new Transformers, I'm sorry, there's a few Transformers fans. No, I, oh, yeah, and it was blasphemy to see what they did. But anyway, really, you guys are too young, but if you haven't seen the original Transformers cartoon, just watch it and thank me later. Okay, that's the only Transformers movie that exists in my mind. But I'll tell you what, pay money for it. They're going to make it really hard for you to pay money for this because this industry, unfortunately, doesn't quite understand that they have a supply-demand problem. But we'll get to that later. So this is very broad, very vague language. In fact, you could even read some of it to see that a search engine could, by all means, be Reddit. The, the language is clearly not written by technologists. It was clearly written by lobbyists. And if you start looking, the, the language we heard time and time again was it's just foreign sites, it's just foreign sites. We're only targeting foreign sites, which is a clever little weasel word. Uh, because while you weren't targeting domestic sites, you were affecting them, right? It's the difference between saying, well, we weren't targeting that village that got blown up in the process. They just got blown up in the process. And, it was so naive that you could even look at something like the domain name. So we use a, a URL shortener. You guys are probably all familiar with that. You've seen this on Twitter, like bit.ly, for instance. Uh, that is .ly. Uh, it is not a US domain name. It is actually a Olivian one. Um, and for that matter, uh, Reddit uses a shortener that is technically an Italian domain. So what exactly constitutes foreign or domestic? This is, again, what happens when you have lobbyists, not technologists, writing legislation. And when we see stuff like this, this is Steve. I read a co-founder. This is the view, actually, we had from our office. I wanted to give him the window view because I figured, you know, he's doing all the heavy lifting on the non-technical side. Um, he gets angry. We get really frustrated by this. And so angry, in fact, that the rage face spins around 360 degrees. Uh, we get so angry by this, but we are technologists. We are people who want to solve problems through technology. And we know that the best answers will win. If all links are created equal on the internet, you know that you can start up a search engine tomorrow and compete with Google if you can provide a better search engine. Um, this is what drives all the innovation in the internet industry. In fact, we did this with Hipmunk, where we looked at things like kayak search results. And we saw, you'll notice, there are 20 pages of search results here. This is, in fact, the most awful flight you could take for this query. It's $6,000. It has a bunch of stops. It's just terrible. But yet they show it in search results. And what's funny is they even have a thing down here. It says they have the technology to filter these out. So presumably they keep this here because there's some masochist somewhere in the world who's like, honey, I just found it. I found the worst flight for our honeymoon. It's going to cost way too much. We're going to hate each other by the end of it. But I got it. 
<laughs> golly. Now I see that and I just think, oh, here we go again. Total rage face. This is not how it works. Um, and so this is, what, this, is what, this is what spurs innovation. This is what spurred Hitmonk. We just wanted simpler, better search results. We wanted to sort by agony, not price, because people actually want to take the least agonizing flight, not the cheapest. And that, in that case, you'll see the cheapest price is actually further down because it's a little agonizing. We allow people to open up tabs in the same window. This is, this is internet innovation. When we see problems, we apply solutions because we know the better ones can win. We did the same thing for hotel search. Heat maps let you see the best parts of town based on shopping or food or vice, depending on what kind of vacation you want. If you want a family vacation, of course, you'd stay away from the areas of high vice, like there. Uh, <laughs> and we sort those rooms by ecstasy, because we want you to get the max joy per dollar. Again, we identify a problem, we create a solution, and we know that if we can out-execute, we can win. Now, I don't care what Tom Friedman has says, I have checked this out with all the people at NASA, the world is not flat, all right? I don't care how many books he sold, but the World Wide Web is flat. All right, we talk about something all the time in technology that is leapfrogging, right? You go on a road trip across America, you see these telephone poles everywhere you go. In the developing world, you probably won't find too many telephone poles. You'll actually see plenty more of these cell towers because there's no reason to put up those poles if you've got this new cellular technology. See, these towers come everywhere. This, this leapfrogging of innovation is the kind of thing that we relish, that we love, and it, it's what provides the fact that right now, we can actually see what someone is having for breakfast anywhere in the world. You can actually see a photo of someone tweeting their breakfast. This is a Stroop waffle. If you've never had one, it's a fabulous Dutch uh, cookie waffle thing with a little caramel on the inside. You put it on top of your coffee, it warms it up. It, it's just beautiful. It lets us see things like this in real time. And at the same time, that technology also lets us watch revolutions in real time. It takes someone with a camera and an internet connection in order to share these images and share these ideas. And this seems very great. It seems like this democratization of information. This is what we're all striving for as Americans, right? This is something that has been seared into our brains since we were little, right? This is what's so important. Uh, and we, we get this idea that maybe this level playing field, this American dream is, is uniquely American, but it turns out it, it's, it's very much not. And it's also not something that is unique to Silicon Valley. Uh, in fact, Reddit was started in Boston. Uh, and so many startups are proving very clearly that you don't have to go running out to Silicon Valley in order to start a company because, like I said, the Internet is a free and fair marketplace of ideas. It's the most efficient marketplace of ideas the world has ever seen. And this is incredibly powerful. Think of all the people up until this point, all of the people who had brilliant ideas, who had the, ability, the total ability and the total drive, but were left out, were, that missed out on an opportunity because they were born at the wrong place, at the wrong time, to the wrong race, to the wrong religion, gender. So, many, so much genius, so much of human progress has been missed out on because of a lack of access. And while the internet is not a cure-all, it is incredibly transformative for people who do have that access and can get their ideas on a global stage. Now, I had an incredible privilege just a couple months after Mubarak fell to go to Cairo. And so there I am doing the tourist thing at four in the morning. Uh, the reason we had to go at four in the morning, well, I should back this up, I was there with the State Department. Uh, the US State Department was winning hearts and minds in Cairo after the revolution by hosting a tech entrepreneurship conference. And I got to speak there to a bunch of Egyptian tech entrepreneurs. Now, we very foolishly label people like me as revolutionaries here in the States. Uh, we are far from it. In fact, I actually got to hang out with legit revolutionaries in Egypt who weren't just busy getting their revolution on, they then went to figure out what new companies they could start in this new Egypt. Now, there's still plenty of work to be done, no doubt. But what I saw there was incredibly awe-inspiring. Now, the reason we had to go out to the pyramids at four in the morning was, was twofold. One, because we were doing all-day conferences for that week, and I barely even left the Marriott. So the only time to do it when we weren't doing a conference was really early. And part of the reason we had to do it so early is because traffic is so, so bad in Cairo. It could take hours to get from one side of the city to the other. Incidentally, they have awesome traffic signs. I wish, I wish just this awesome sign alone could be enough to do something about the traffic problems, but it's not. So, some enterprising Egyptians had an idea. So many of the phones that broadcast the Arab Spring, so many of the phones that broadcast the revolution, so the of us sitting in our laptops here in the comfortable US of A could see them, were also the same tools that could power their business. They created this application that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I do not know Arabic. Uh, Beitualik, there you go, I gave it a go. Um, and this is an incredible, incredibly simple and incredibly brilliant application, which is to say you are on some major thoroughfare in Cairo, right? You whip out your phone and you can tell instantly the traffic 
of all the other major highways because they've been crowdsourced. Because people just like you, who've been sitting on whatever road it is you're trying to get on, have told the real-time traffic status of that road. And so they've aggregated it through a wonderful crowdsourcing application that's been installed on tens of thousands of phones all over Cairo. Now this is the kind of execution that I just, I love. Because it's gonna be a long time before someone comes in there and comes up with some brilliant top-down solution that you know, gauges traffic in real time. They just hacked it. They came up with a solution because enough people had smartphones to create something that everyone could benefit from with a simple iPhone application. Now this is becoming a company that's growing not only in Egypt, but spreading out Alexandria and will probably spread to more and more of the Arabic speaking world. Now what's so cool about this is this pair of startup founders were asking me the exact same questions that I get asked in Brooklyn. The exact same questions that I get asked when I'm in Palo Alto. Now there are nuances. It's very, very different, obviously, starting a company in Egypt compared to starting it here. But when it comes to actually building something people want, when it comes to actually making something that improves people's lives through technology, the answers are the exact same. And the questions are the exact same. And this all works, again, because it's a truly level playing field. Now, apparently the rest of the world isn't like this. Apparently, so many of us geeks, technologists, startup founders, learned that the playing field is not level in Washington. And in fact, what usually dictates policy, more often than not, is lobbying dollars. This is a lovely infographic provided by the folks at Politico. Uh, you'll see on the left all the lobbying dollars spent in 2010 and 2011 by the tech industry over here. <laughs> over here, Hollywood and the entertainment industry. Actually, we've run out of space. Let's see if... Uh, there we go, yeah. There was, there was so much slide that it, it actually took a physical effort to move it up. So we had been out lobbied. <laughs> uh, the tech industry realized a little too late that there had not been enough money spent and the result was some really bad legislation, SOPA and PIPA, that threatened to destroy what I said is this wonderfully level playing field. Now as we went through in our thorough analysis about Reddit, the site could not have existed. In fact, any user-generated site could not have existed in a world where within hours of some kind of post that described circumventing some kind of uh, anti-piracy, or involved anything having to do with piracy, could have brought the site down. There's simply no way that a site like Reddit even gets started uh, because we very quickly get shut down and investors don't want anything to do with a company that is potentially going to be shut down where its first 20 hires need to be lawyers and not developers. And so an entire industry goes bottom up. And all the things we love and hold dear, YouTube, Twitter, hopefully Reddit, Tumblr, all these things that have made this social media revolution possible no longer can exist. And so these bills, which were pitched in a very, very benign way, right? Who doesn't want to fight piracy? This was actually something that both sides could agree on. The left and the right could come together despite not being able to agree on anything else. Here was something that everyone in Washington thought would pass before the end of the year. This was something that everyone was gonna go home feeling great about, put on their hats and sing that New Year's Eve song and feel wonderful because lo and behold, the left and the right got together in Congress to get something done. But some attentive folks on the internet said, no, 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 hold on. No, this is not how it's gonna work. And I actually was not on the cutting edge of this. There were people who had been paying attention to these bills in their different forms for years. I got an email one day from Christina Shu, who works with me at BreadPig, and her friends who run fightforthefuture.org, which is one of these organizations that had been watching these bills in their other incarnations for quite some time, were putting together some awareness raising splash pages and wanted to know if we could help. And I found myself a few days later actually in Washington, D.C., meeting with some of these representatives and senators. The representative uh, Chaffetz, who you saw in the video earlier, he was the one who also famously said, bring in the nerds. Uh, he actually uh, was one of the most receptive, and that's him standing there next to me. He was one of the most receptive guys. This is a Republican from Utah, a fairly young representative, who basically said, I hear you loud and clear. I told him my story, just as I've told you my story before. The, the good fortune that Steve and I had in starting Reddit in, in having it uh, be acquired by Conan Aston, having it grow to the site it is today, happened because these laws did not exist. And had they existed, my whole story, my whole reason for being here would not have happened. And I'd probably actually be an immigration lawyer uh, if things had worked out differently. I was actually at a Waffle House where I decided I want to be a startup founder, but that's, that's a whole other story. I was still waiting for that Waffle House endorsement. I love, 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 love my Waffle House epiphany story, but that's for another time. So fight for the future, which today continues to fight 
for our online rights, came up with some really brilliant ways to raise some awareness. They put together pages like this. The, I don't know how many of you saw this. This was a wonderful radio interview that was done with the Beebs in which he was learning about some legislation that would make exactly what he did, singing copyrighted songs and putting them on YouTube, illegal. And he was terrified by it. Now, he'd probably be even more terrified about the thought of spending five years in prison. Uh, <laughs> let's be real, Beebs wouldn't last very long. Um, <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, he saw the thing that gave him a chance to be the superstar, regardless of whether you like him or not, and he saw that chance being squashed, and he thought that was unreasonable. Now, if we had Justin Bieber on our side, we couldn't lose, right? That was what we thought. We, we, we saw Fight for the Future put together another page that very simply just said, we work for the internet. All of the people who actually make their living doing various stuff online threw up a photo. The folks at Tumblr also helped with this too. We actually had a clandestine meeting uh, during SantaCon. Are you guys familiar with SantaCon? It's where everyone dresses up as Santa Claus and gets drunk for a day. So it, it's terrifying for children in and around the city. Um, and I actually, I held off on my celebrations uh, until after this clandestine meeting. Uh, but I was the only one there in a full Santa costume, so it was kind of awkward. So all these New York tech CEOs were getting together, talking about what we could do to solve this problem. And, and this is one of the things that emerged from it. What we saw start to come about, though, was just people coming up with really clever applications of open data sets that had been opened up by organizations who simply said, we need to make government more transparent. Now, having tons of data is great. But if you don't know what they mean, if you have no way to parse it or visualize it, it becomes a lot less valuable. And so they started to make really simple applications that could even geolocate based on where you were to give you a really quick and easy way to get that phone number or even connect you instantly with your senator or representative. And this is the kind of innovation that you start seeing online. This is why I was talking about being a leader full movement and not a leader less movement. Uh, you started seeing things like the SOPA Reddit. It was a subreddit that was created uh, by a bunch of random Redditors to talk about all things SOPA planning. Now, you, again, you can create a subreddit about whatever you want. One of my favorite ones is foodporn.reddit.com. Uh, wonderful, high-res, beautiful photos of food, in case you couldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's that's the kind of spontaneity that we want to create. We want to create tools where people come up with great ideas, whether it's a Tumblr blog showing random photos of cats that look like Hitler, or another great website, uh, or, or anything else. That's the kind of thing that spurs innovation, and someone with a good idea can instantly have it spread all over the world. And so then all of a sudden we heard Representative Chaffetz's call, right? He said we needed some nerds, and I actually got invited to testify before the House with a few other geeks about why we thought these bills were so bad. Um, but it turns out this never happened. I actually got a really nice, nifty, formal invitation. I was so excited. Actually, at the time, I was horrified because I was on vacation uh, <laughs> doing some things that are not terribly legal in the United States. And, <laughs> oh, that sounds much worse than it is. But, um, <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, geez, all right, now I've, this vacation has just ended. I'm spending the next three days now planning out this house testimony. And so, we started putting all this stuff together. I started talking to all the people that I knew had had experience doing all this, furiously taking notes and, and preparing all this. And then I realized, oh, hold on a second. I just got another email saying it's not happening. Now, why is it not happening? It's because they didn't need us anymore. It was because the internet had risen up and said, no, 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 SOPA, PIPA, these are terrible ideas. And what really sparked it, what really finally got this thing, a bunch of mainstream attention. And, and this was after weeks of it not being covered by all the you know large, uh, television media organizations, uh, was the fact that sites were blacking out. And this was something that had started within a few subreddits on the site where administrators of things like subreddits for cute animals or for politics or various things said, we want to take our site down on the 18th. And eventually this bubbled up and the admins at Reddit, I'm only on the board now, but the admins at Reddit saw that the community absolutely wanted this. And so they said, all right, we're going to take the site down on the 18th. Not long thereafter, Wikipedia says, we're going to take the site down on the 18th. And this was a huge, huge moment. At this point, you have, to, you have to talk about it. And so then within a span of about three days, every single large media organization started talking about the blackout. And they started talking about the protests that were actually happening, the geekiest protests ever that were happening in New York and that were happening in San Francisco in front of our senator's offices who were still in favor of PIPA, who were still very strongly supportive of it. Even after all the phone calls, even after all the letters, even after everything, we still needed to have these protests. But when they actually happened, when they actually showed up, when thousands of people showed up in Midtown, fortunately it was a very nice day uh, weather-wise, showed up in Midtown to protest our senators in the most responsible, respectful, and 
I'm sure geekiest protest in the history of New York, they had to listen. And in the span of like 72 hours, I found myself on literally every single cable news network. It was madness. But they were so, so curious because now all of a sudden Wikipedia had blacked out. What could this mean that one of the top 10 most popular sites on the internet was blacking out? Why would this be happening? Well, it was because <laughs> the internet, because of all of us on the internet simply said, these bills shall not pass. You were probably wondering how I was going to pull that in there, but all right. Now, and oh, we, need, we, we should darken the lights just for the Gandalf photo. Here's the thing. This was something where now in every subsequent conversation that I've had, whether it's with an elected official, oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, for dramatic effect too at the, the calm dimming, every single elected official I've met with since has now this new perception of the internet. And I have to remind them, the internet is made of people. The people who use the internet are your constituents, right? Let's not, let's not separate this out too much, right? The people who are using the internet are the same people who are voting for you or not voting for you. And there is this tremendous power now that the, the American people have shown. There is really this idea that there is some kind of button that we can press and the internet gets all fired up and starts emailing and faxing and writing letters. But the reality is these are just the American people exercising their right over their employees, right? They're Congress people. Remember who they work for, they work for us. And after the fact, we started seeing things like this in the press. Now this is former Senator Chris Dodd, now head of the MPAA, basically saying, I can't, I don't want to read between the lines here, but <laughs> this was, this was a really telling quote because the understanding was, well, if we're going to help you with your reelection campaign, then when it comes time to help us, you will. There are two things that move people in Washington. There's the dollars because they've got to get reelected. And then there's the votes because, well, that's what gets them actually elected. And I think it was a tremendous reminder for all of us that we still actually have the power with our votes and the things that can actually galvanize people to do and to exercise their abilities to influence their elected officials, those things can all just happen online. They can all happen organically. They can all happen when we all coalesce behind an idea that we all believe is important. And it doesn't take any kind of top-down orchestration. It takes enough people who are just furious. Now, the internet has done a tremendous job. January 18th, all of you, thank you for any of you who helped, even if it was just a retweet or an upvote or a call or a letter or an email. This was all incredibly, incredibly valuable because at the end of the day, there is no one who shows up at MSNBC unless there is an army of millions who are actually behind him or her. We've shown that we could say no to something. We have shown that we could be against terrible, terrible legislation. And I hope I've convinced you why it was so terrible. Um, we've even recently had a fundraiser for a billboard outside of Lamar Smith's offices in San Antonio. Now, Lamar Smith was the author of SOPA, the House bill, and then the primary figurehead behind it. Um, we're still working out the artwork, but it's going to look some, like something to the effect of don't mess with the internet. Um, the next step is actually to go further and start saying, excuse me, is to actually start proposing the kind of change we want to see. The next step is to start talking about things like reasonable copyright reform, to talk about things like the fact that we can't sing happy birthday in public. Right? Because we can't. You actually cannot. I'm terrified to do it because of the suit hammer that will come down on me, and I'm also a bad singer. These are clearly not helping encourage innovation. That was the point. That was the point of copyright. That's the point of things like patents. Software patents are a terrible, terrible mess that are only really abused by trolls uh, and, and, other large, and large organizations using it as a way to stifle innovation. Um, these are all things that we'd like to see, but most importantly, we want to see our online rights codified just like our offline rights. It is totally reasonable for all of us as proud Americans to enjoy rights that we have offline. And there are things that we, are, we know are fundamental to why this country is here. But of course, for all of the foresight uh, that our founding fathers had, they did not see the internet coming. And if they had, Wow, I could only imagine what they would think of all the cats. Um, but they didn't have the foresight for that. But it's okay, because we do. And, and so this is, this is the sort of thing that Brad Pitt gets up to these days with billboards. But what really excites me is the fact that technologically, we are right. Technologically, we have a tremendous advantage here because censorship is actually something that does not work with this technology in any of its forms. And in fact, 
there's been evidence now. This is the Hargreaves report. This was commissioned by the British government just a few months back. The report came out. And it's actually shown that piracy isn't nearly as bad as we might think it is. A lot of the numbers we read about piracy are a little flimsy. Uh, and in fact, we have to start to wonder if really the best effort is to be made trying to squelch piracy in a way that we know is futile, or perhaps to start reimagining and rethinking the copyright laws that cause them all to exist. Now, it seems really easy Really easy to be like, well, piracy is bad, all right? <laughs> uh, but so more and more studies have shown that where things like Spotify exist, uh, Pirate Bay downloads of music start to go down. It, it, to me, to someone who's an innovator, someone who wants to just solve problems through an entrepreneurial method, it actually seems to me that it's a much more useful way to use one's time instead of lobbying, to actually innovate solutions that people are willing to pay money for. Because there are ways, there are models to actually sustain all the artists we genuinely care about. Now, you guys all know about Kickstarter, I hope. Show of hands, how many of you know about Kickstarter? Great, this is just a glimpse into our future. Now, Kickstarter is only two years old. It says, if you have a creative project, you can go online, shoot a video, tell a story, tell them how much money you need, and get it fundraised. Now, a few years ago, I thought, this is an awesome idea. But a few months ago, I thought, this is a world-changing idea. Because I saw the New York Times report that at the last Sundance, 10% of all the films at Sundance were funded on Kickstarter. This site is only a couple years old, and 10% of the films at Sundance were funded on Kickstarter. Now, if we are genuinely interested in making sure that all of that genius gets discovered and shared, we should be really excited by the fact that I am darn sure that 10% of Sundance uh, films is going to not only go up, but is also going to include plenty of producers and plenty of directors and plenty of actors and plenty of talented artists who otherwise would have never gotten a chance. And that is incredibly powerful. And when we start to consider that the actual costs of piracy may not be as bad as we think, when we actually start seeing more and more of these studies like the Hargreaves report and more and more studies that come out that show that perhaps this is not the alternative. We really are interested in promoting creative works. We need to do more to encourage the kind of innovation that gets these creative works funded. Have you guys seen that Aziz Ansari is now giving away his latest comedy album? For $5, yeah, check it out. If you guys, I hope you guys all know who Aziz Ansari is. He's following a model that was blazed by none other than Louis C.K., who made over a million dollars, one million dollars, by simply saying, hey, fans of my work, would you please, I know you can torrent it, but would you please pay me five dollars and download this wonderful comedy show that I put together for you? And he made a million dollars. Aziz Ansari, I am sure, is going to do just as well. And they are hacking it using some very basic technology. The same technology that enables this piracy allows your idea to go all over the world instantly. And if you think about it the right way, it allows you to actually make money and be supported by this idea being spread everywhere. And if you really believe that the best solutions come from the private sector and not necessarily from uh, an overreaching, overbearing uh, federal government, then I think you'd have to agree that the solutions for piracy are actually through innovation. And those solutions are going to look a lot more like Kickstarter, are going to look a lot more like what Aziz Ansari and Louis C.K. have done. And that is really, really exciting because it means more and more people getting on that level playing field. And that's really all that I'm interested in doing. I, I have no interest in pursuing politics any further than I have the last three or four months, and I'm very, very happy to get back to startup life. Uh, but I feel like there is now this bat signal uh, that is, it's stationed. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but there is an internet bat signal. And the next time something like this down, comes down the pipe, it will, be, it will be illuminated. I can't promise that Batman will come. We're still working out contract disputes. But the fact of the matter is we will not have actually won until we have the laws that we need to protect this level playing field. And that's what I wanted to come here to talk to you guys about. Now, if there's a chance for you to ask questions, I want to do it. And if you can't ask a question right now, email me, tweet at me, and I'll be here afterward. But thank you very much for having me. I guess, yeah, come on up to the mic, everyone. Uh, so my question, I know you said you're trying to get out of political life, but let me just pull you back in just for a little bit longer. Okay. Um, given all of this, 
if we were going to redesign our political system to kind of account for this sort of mass participation, how do you think we would best do it? Wow, uh, Reddit's for everything. <laughs> no, that could be a terrible idea. I, oh goodness, you know, and there are so many smart people working on trying to solve this problem right now, uh, and we're seeing a lot of very clever stuff that's happening, taking, like, creating, creating stuff with the data that we're now getting access to, uh, but when it comes to actually, let's say, writing legislation, there are certain things that I am convinced a crowd needs an editor for. I think we saw this in the, so, so Reddit actually proposed a free information, uh, free internet act. And, and it, at some point, at some level, it, the internet is incredibly good. This disparate group of all of us is very good at curating stuff, about throwing a bunch of ideas out there. But at some point, and if you've ever tried to put up a public wiki or Google Doc, you know what I'm talking about. You need someone who can sort of curate and sort of edit and take those very best ideas. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced about Reddit's everywhere uh, or the idea of participation at, at, at every level where we get this sort of hyper direct democracy. Because at the end of the day, I feel like there is a value to at least having uh, to the fact that there are some, that there are other things we have going on in our lives that don't make us the very best candidates to make a decision about everything. But there are absolutely people whose ideas need to be heard at the highest levels. And we, we, we're seeing baby steps. For instance, the White House launched their, uh, was it We the People petition site? This is, these are baby steps. These are baby steps, but so much of it is going to have to come from outside. I really, really believe that if you want to start seeing the really significant kind of change, it's gonna have to ha it's just gonna happen, and they're gonna have no choice but to say, all right, the, this, this, is, this is the way it has to be. And we're seeing it in fundraising, uh, we're seeing it hopefully now in the legislative process, uh, but I'm just most excited about the fact that this is, this is a turning point that we cannot go back from. Um, we actually saw this now most recently with the Coney campaign, which probably had the most bizarre ending. I don't even know if it's <laughs> over yet. <laughs> I know, I know none of you expected that. I didn't see that one coming at all. Um, <laughs> gosh, was that in poor taste? All right. The, the fact of the matter is, though, there is, the, the, there is this ubiquity now that just did not exist four, five, or six years ago. And that is not changing. There are only going to be more people engaged and active. Uh, but the real challenge just starts with getting us actually interested, because uh, there are a lot of cute f cat photos. That's it. I mean, the, the 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 other great challenge is yes, while the playing field is incredibly level, it means anyone can get on it, and it means the competition is incredibly good. And I'm not joking. The re there, those YouTube videos of cats that I watch have millions of views because millions of people are watching them. There are there is no shortage of great competition for people's attention. And, and I hope what we get out of this are better tools that help us filter the stuff that we really need to see. There was a long answer that, I don't know, hopefully. OK, all right, who's next? What a gentleman, awesome. Hi, OK, so Hello. after talking about this bat signal that you were yes. talking about, do you think you now that we have that and that people will now come wherever the secret place it is uh, and give votes or money, do you think that means that there's no longer a need for a law to prevent things like this uh, from happening? Or No, no, I think more than ever. I think, I think we have, we, we were, I mean, there were like 10 mailing lists that different people had created as SOPA and PIPA got underway. Now we've sort of consolidated. We've all actually met each other. So much of the work that was done was just happening through the internet because it's the internet. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy that exists, but I, that's like the, that is the emergency alarm that I don't ever want to have to push or pull or break the glass or whatever the metaphor is going to be. Um, I think it's so, so important that we actually just get some really, really basic, easy to understand that any American can get behind uh, laws on the books that actually say that we have protected speech online and that we have some basic rights online just like we do in uh, Neat Space. Thank you. Um, so mine's more about kind of like internet phenomena or those like movements. We saw this with SOPA and then with the Kony you kind of talked about and that we are able to get everywhere fast, but how mm -hmm. do you think we were able to like sustain those movements over periods of time? Mm -hmm. Within like a week it seemed like Kony had dropped and then yeah. once SOPA, I think if you ask most people now what SOPA is, they will have completely forgotten. Mm -hmm from three months. So what, how do you think is like the key to make sure that like you get that energy and then you sustain it for extended yes. periods of time to actually get the change you This need? is, gosh, this is the, this is the question. It, it, it comes up whether someone's talking about like a viral video campaign or anything else because you always see this huge traffic surge or this attention surge and then it plummets. And sometimes it even plummets further below than what it was before. And that's the thing you obviously want to avoid above all. 
The, the important thing is once you've actually built the relationship, to find ways to maintain it. Now you don't want to, so Fight for the Future is doing this in particular because they've got a mailing list now of millions mm -hmm. and they don't want to have to hit the panic button every week just to get people because it's the boy who cries wolf problem. Instead, it's a matter of creating places. You know, so there, there are sites that are just inherently good at this. All the sites you guys waste all your time on, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, that are inherently good at keeping people engaged whether or not it's a cause for alarm or just it's a reason to come back to. Um, and it's a matter of just feeding out progress. And, and it's the kind of thing that you even see nonprofits doing really well. How many of you guys use Donors Choose? Oh my God, it's the greatest nonprofit ever. Okay, well not the great, it, it's very good. Um, basically, uh, public school classrooms all over the country have teachers who don't have enough money for even basic supplies. You can make a donation for as little as a dollar to a specific classroom project. And this teacher says, She's in Baltimore, she needs uh, dry erase boards. You can give her some money and you actually get updates from the teacher. You get even sometimes thank you notes from the students. You get this connected experience that goes well beyond the first time you give the dollar. That's the kind of sort of prolonged engagement we need to give and we need to have, and this is something that I think, you know, Fight for the Future has been doing very well with um, and that others will need to follow suit is to make us very aware of like some milestones where we need to understand, okay, this is where we're at because this whole, this process of writing legislation and then actually getting someone to bring it to the floor, it is a long and tedious and painful process uh, and it's not something that holds people's attention like cats. Now if we, <laughs> if we described all of the progress using cat photos or videos, <laughs> that, could, that could really help. But it, that, it's a big challenge and it's a challenge not just for us but for everyone. So if you solve it, you'll be very, very rich and successful. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about the original brainstorm session between you and your coworker or mm -hmm. your co-founder um, for Reddit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, how did that start? Okay, the short version of this was we applied to Y Combinator with a very different idea, and we got rejected, and then we got drunk, and then the next morning it was it sucked, and then the next morning we were hungover on a train, and Paul called me back. We were on the train back to Virginia, and Paul called me back and said, "Listen, we made a mistake." We don't like your idea, but we like you guys. So if you come back up, we'll come up with a new idea and you guys can be in Y Combinator. So we had this meeting for about an hour with Paul and the three of us just got to talking. And Paul's big thing was, we initially wanted to make an app so you could order food from your phone so you didn't have to wait in line. This was in 05, everyone had Razor phones, there were no smartphones. It was ahead of its time to be polite. Uh, <laughs> and although I'd love for it to exist, um, they, uh, and he was, he was really big on web applications because it's not, you don't have to rely on AT&T to have everyone install your app, and something that would solve our own problem. We had, we had, we had done that with the food thing, but we you know, needed something that was more viable. And so we basically just started with, all right, well, Steve reads Slashdot every day. He really, really loved the community there. I was an occasional Slashdot reader, but I just read a ton of uh, news websites, just a bunch of tabs open. And it just, we both had content problems where we had too much of it. And Steve had seen the value of community, but we needed a way to sort of aggregate it a little bit better. And uh, I, by the end of that conversation, to Paul's credit, he had codified, what did he say? He said, uh, front page of the web. He was like, if you guys can make that, then I think you'll be onto something. And so we're like, all right, that's ambitious, let's do it. And uh, using actually delicious slash popular, this is a real test of geekage, delicious slash popular was our main inspiration. If you notice aesthetically, we, we're also terrible designers. Uh, <laughs> that's why I read it looks like it does. Uh, we, we saw that as a good first step, but it was a byproduct of people just bookmarking stuff. We wanted something where people said explicitly, here's something you need to see right now. It's, it might be ephemeral, but you need to see it at this moment. And about a month after we launched Reddit, we learned about Dig which was Reddit's chief competitor for about five or six years. And uh, that was a horrifying hour because we realized, holy crap, they've got VC funding, they have a celebrity founder, they've been doing it for six months. Uh, but it's a good lesson for all startup founders because that should not at all dismay you. Um, and it, it, I mean, it, it dismayed us for about an hour or so, but then we thought, all right, let's just brush our shoulders off and try to, try to do this. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a wonderful collaboration between me and Steve who had been, we'd been friends since freshman, actually first day. So if any of you guys have relationships that you consider good working relationships as well as good sort of friend relationships, there might be a co-founder there. Uh, it's a, it really is a lot like a marriage, uh, a sexless marriage. Although most marriages are apparently without sex, so maybe it's just like marriage. <laughs> so I've been told. <laughs> yes. Hello. You spoke a little bit about how um, 
the laws today are stifling innovation. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you on that. I mean, you can see of Yahoo suing Facebook yes, about Facebook. the personalized pages and all Come that. Come on, Yahoo. Yeah. But how do you promote innovation where the innovators don't have, you know, um, ways to protect themselves from yes. being uh, you know, copied? So, so this works in so many areas of patent law, and I'm no expert in patent law, but I, I've, I, having filed a provisional patent and staying in a Holiday Inn last night, I'm gonna answer this. The problem with software patents is that by their very nature, you are, you're basically gonna be infringing on some other work. Uh, the, way, the way software is written is so, imagine an infinite Lego set. You know, you're, you're, you're picking apart at libraries and pieces that other people have put together. It's, it's a very murky business. And so Reddit is open source, but when it wasn't open source, that source was just chilling on our computer. And the idea of, say, patenting uh, an upvote click is, is kind of absurd given how many other giants' shoulders we're standing on. And so it's just, you know, again, it's the kind of thing where it makes a lot of sense back in 1776 when everyone's first talking about it because software doesn't exist. But today, it's really just hampering innovation. So you see things like Yahoo suing Facebook, and then you also see these jerk-offs, patent trolls. There's a really good NPR story about one in particular who are just basically extorting small companies. And, and it really doesn't help anyone. And I, I, and I warn startups, too, who want to go down the road of getting a patent. If you do it, it seems like a reasonable thing, right? If you don't have the money to back it up, that is to win the court case, to pay for the lawyers, it's irrelevant anyway. Because some larger competitor is just gonna outlawyer you, and then what? What was the point of the patent in the first place? So, not to end on a downer note, but I think we're out of time. So, I'm gonna be up there uh, afterward. Yes, to the left. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yes, so please, do not be a stranger. Email me, uh, I got a mailing list thing, tweet at me, yell at me, whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Oh, but thank you very much, and, and seriously, for any of you who participated in any way, shape, or form in this OPA PIPA fight, it could not have happened without you. And for those of you who didn't, shame on you. No, <laughs> no but thank you, seriously.